We will turn now to the fourth panel, Achieving Prosecutions at the National Level. The chair of this panel is Professor Charles Villavicencio. He is the Emeritus Professor at the University of Cape Town and Visiting Professor in the Conflict Resolution Program at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. He has authored and edited several publications, including two books, Walk With Us and Listen, Political Reconciliation in Africa, in another title, The Provocations of Amnesty, Memory, Justice, and Impunity. Professor Charles Vicencio, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, sir, ladies and gentlemen. It's a privilege to be here and to meet with all of you. Um, I'm going to approach this session a little differently in as much as I will make an opening comment. I'm then going to briefly defer to each one of the panelists to speak for five, six minutes on the focus of their particular challenge in the work that they're doing at the moment. Five minutes each. And then we will come back and we will talk in more depth on the particular questions that have been proposed and in the substance of their work. But let us start. Um, there is a sense in which I would want to suggest in this particular panel, and maybe in the previous one, where the tire hits the road. This is where it happens. We talk about international law, but what is happening on the ground? In Belfast, in Uganda, and elsewhere. That's where the rub occurs. And that is why I'm going to ask each one of our panelists to say a little bit about the work that they are doing now in their respective situations and what they regard as important, good and bad, in their particular situations. I think it's probably right that I introduce myself very, very briefly in very broad terms because I'm in the presence of lawyers and their cousins <laughs> and uh, international people. Um, I'm not a lawyer. That's what I want to say. That's my confession. And I need to tell you that throughout my career, and as you can see from the color of my hair, it's been a long career, almost 100 years. <laughs> I've always had a congenial and sometimes less than congenial relationship with lawyers. Uh, they would wave their finger and tell me what the black letter of the law said, you know, and as a completely naive person, I would say, so what? In the Truth Commission in South Africa, where I was the National Research Director, we spoke about how do we get at truth? Through prosecution or not? And the question continues to hang. Here's my major confession. I cut my critical and ethical teeth uh, on Hannah, Anna, Hannah Arendt. And I remember so clearly, and it's documented in so many different places, in her response to the Eichmann trial. She said, yes, hang him. But what else are you going to do? What else are you going to do? And that's the issue that tortures me. As I walked through the... Uh, uh, through the museum yesterday, the archive, and as I've listened to this very important debate over the last two days, my mind kept going back to my experience 
within the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The thing that made us controversial, forgive me, I think the thing that brought peace to the South African situation was conditional amnesty. Not popular, but it did something at the time in that place. And context is context is context. Uh, we had over 7,000 people applying for amnesty. We were immediately able to dismiss the first 2,500 because they were taking chances. But we had 5,000 more or less serious applications for amnesty. Just under 900 were granted amnesty. So this isn't, wasn't Santa Claus standing outside handing out candy to the kids when they came in. It was tough. And when the commission was over, we identified just over 300 alleged perpetrators who did not receive amnesty, who in our opinion ought to be further investigated. We sent those to the Ministry of Justice, we gave them to the National Prosecutorial uh, uh, Commission. And you know what? Nothing's happened. Now, in between, there were one or two for various political and other reasons who slipped through. But by and large, nothing happened. Um, and that left many of us who were involved in the commission with deep, deep, disappointment. I want to ask two questions of myself, as I do of the panel and everybody here. The first, you know, I remember a conversation that I had with uh, President Mandela on the day that we handed him the five-volume report in Pretoria. And Mr. Mandela could charm, you know that. He said he's gone through this report. Well, he'd only received it an hour or so earlier. <laughs> but he said there's a little chapter in here called, called The Causes, Motives, and Perspectives of Perpetrators. And he said this could be the most important chapter in the report. Because if we don't understand that, you know what he said? It'll happen again. It will happen again. And so I've been scratching my head ever since then, and I refer back to that little chapter of about 14 pages. What is it that is the final emotional trigger that results in genocide, war crimes, etc.? The first one is propaganda. And I was reading the, uh, I nearly said the Cape Times, I was reading the, the, the New York Times this morning where there's an excellent article on Hitler's rise to power. And he was a propagandist. Propaganda, false truth, and some of us understand what that is all about with Mr. Trump and others. Populism, you just sell it and people, until people imbibe it. And ultimately, the development of an ethic, a false ethic, that justifies atrocities in the name of national security, however you wish to phrase it. And I think that's what Mr. Mandela was talking about when he said, unless you understand the causes, motives, and perspectives, it'll happen again. People get mugged. And so in many instances, one of the things we found in South Africa is that some of the major perpetrators, and I could entertain you with stories, were also victims. They fell, they became victims of a propaganda system. Were they perpetrators? God knows, yes. But how did they get there? Was it their fault? But you've all thought about those things. <clears throat>
I want to move on to the second question. Not what triggers genocide, etc., etc., but what was dear Auntie Hannah Arendt saying when she said, what more are you going to do? And the short answer is, uh, I don't know, but it's something that I'm trying to work out in my own mind in relation to many African situations and other situations around the world. One is that unless there is economic transformation, including land distribution, the chances of peace are minimal, of enduring peace. Number one, economic transformation. The second one is to learn to live together. You know, my boss during the Truth Commission was Archbishop Tutu. He's still my boss. He wrote an amazing book, um, and he turned 88 a couple of, a week or so ago. He wrote an amazing book, which he called No Future Without Forgiveness. And I said to him, Father, you are a holy man. You can say this, and you must say that. But you know, most of us, ordinary plebs, we can't rise to that level. Don't you think we should just start off by learning to live together? Show a little bit of respect. Try to understand, but you don't have to love one another. Well, he continues to say that I'm absolutely wrong and I bow to my archbishop. The third one, I think, is just democratic government. It's got to be those things. I want to add two more which we often overlook in post-conflict situations. The one is participation by the international community. Maybe by the ICC, I don't know. To enable us who are coming out of conflict situations to conduct professional, careful, non-partisan investigations as to what's going on. What went on and what is going on. What went on in South Africa in the past days, what is going on in South Africa today with state capture. We need that assistance. Because we have cases going to court and they're thrown out because the investigation has been inadequate. And the other one is education. You know, we have a huge population of young people in South Africa. They call themselves the born frees because they were born after Mr. Mandela uh, was freed from prison. Can I use good language? Who's the boss here? Klaus. Klaus. The majority of those young people don't know what the hell happened during the apartheid years. We've got to educate people. We've got to teach them the emotional tragedy and uh, the history of what happened. So, what I'm saying to you is my concern with the ICC is not an argument as to whether we should have trials and punitive measures and retributive justice. Yes, of course we can. What do you do with the Eichmann? Hang him. That's okay. But I do think that the marketing of the ICC, <coughs> can I say it, is terrible. Most of us don't know what the ICC can do and what it cannot do. Africa has been slow in prosecution. But I want to tell you as an African, a lot of people in Africa think the ICC is just this Western thing over there that's picking on poor African leaders. Eh? We've got work to do at that one. And so let me close off from my side 
and say certainly in the South African situation, the contextual reality of today is this. That unless we have meaningful, structural, institutional transformation, we will have a revolutionary transformation. The show has only begun. It's not over. We've got to work at that. And when I look at this uh, wonderful panel we have, um, <clears throat> I realize that the particular country is represented here, and it's reflected in the work that everybody at this table is doing, is post-conflict stuff. It's relatively easy to sign a peace agreement. Easy? Try reconstruction afterwards. Sometimes it makes the peace agreement look like a Sunday school picnic. It's very, very tough. And I'm going to ask our colleagues to each take just five minutes or so to tell us what they regard as the most important thing that they are facing in their situation today. Um, maybe we can just go down the table and we will start with you, Judge. Tell us about Colombia and the work that you are doing there. I always tell my students there are the two most important truth commissions that have happened in the world are South Africa and Colombia. And if they don't work, God help us all. Continue, sir. Okay, good morning. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for your very inspiring words. In these uh, very first remarks, uh, you have invited us. Uh, I would say that uh, in this post-conflict situation in Colombia that is uh, really uh, very difficult because even though theoretically we could be in a post-conflict situation, but there are other armed groups that today haven't had the, the peace with the government, and so it is not so easily to characterize the global situation as post-conflict situation. But anyhow, after 20 months of being put in operations, that jurisdiction, the peace jurisdiction, <coughs> I am the chief justice of the appeal section. I have to share with you my first emotions, emotions that are from a citizen point of view and Republican emotions in a certain way. And uh, I compare the jurisdiction for peace, the AG, SJP, as a ship that has started its crossing through very tormented and stormy waters. Because from the very beginning, we have faced challenges just after the peace was signed by President Santos and he received the Nobel Prize, he left the government, a new government that was in the power and uh, characterized by, as enemy of the political process, started to introduce different reforms in this normative system. The first one was the intent of introducing a judicial panel just for prosecuting military, breaking the impartial character of this jurisdiction. The second one was to submit to a veto the most important legislation to complete the normative framework that was the statutory law that has to govern the jurisdiction for peace. And one of the last events, very sad, of course, was the rearmament of one of the leaders of these negotiations, the ex-member of the FARC political party, now, Marquez, decided to rearm, and so renounced this process of peace. For that reason, I, I said, Mr. Chairman, that this has been very uh, 
time of reflection, but also of very hard emotions as a judge of this, of this jurisdiction. But fortunately, the process is very well structured. The process was introduced through different constitutional amendments, and so it can resist all the challenges from the opposition and the opposition political parties. In fact, uh, this first challenge of veto the, the statutory law was overthrown by the, by the Constitutional Court that gave reason to the arguments of the jurisdiction, and now we have a very important and solid base in that law. At the same time, after Marquez decided to rearm, 90% of the regular members adhere again to the process and they said that they are very close to continue all the obligations and with the same enthusiasm in order to continue the peace process. And that intent also to introduce a military panel was failed because the, the Congress didn't accept this intent from the political party of the government. So I think that we are sure that now we can continue, but we, we know that the process, the post-conflict, is more hard than just signing a peace treaty because implementation, the good faith practice is very hard. But we know that we have to continue as judges and we continue this ship with a compass, a magnetic compass that indicates us that the only north is justice and the fight against impunity. Thank you, sir, very much indeed. Mike, yes, Chibita, speak to us. Well, thank you. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am a chief prosecutor for Uganda. Uh, last six years, but before that I was a judge of the High Court. But I'm glad to be here, especially because about 30 years ago, I was a graduate student at the University of Iowa. <laughs> and uh, my two professors of international criminal law, Professor Barnes Weston, rest in peace, and uh, Sir Jeffrey Palmer, former Prime Minister of New Zealand, always urged us to find time and visit uh, Nuremberg. So 30 years later, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, the chair wanted us to identify the one challenge. <laughs> Well, um, being chief prosecutor, you prosecute many, many different kinds of crimes. International criminal law is just one of them. You're dealing with uh, corruption cases, you're dealing with uh, sexual, gender-based violence cases, homicides, terrorism, and a wide range. So this is just one of those. Mm. And uh, prosecution is in the middle of uh, investigation and adjudication. And sometimes, as a prosecutor, I uh, can remember the words of, uh, I think, President Obama and my own president have said, the president is not powerful enough, doesn't have enough power. <laughs> this sounded uh, kind of ironic, but as chief prosecutor, sometimes you, you realize you don't have enough power. Uh, to change things, to do things, because the laws are handed to you, uh, the politicians have their own ideas, you have the public to, to think about uh, when you're making decisions, you have victims uh, to think about, and the interesting thing about victims and, uh, and witnesses, they are not completely, at least in our jurisdiction, they are in a way not your responsibility, but among the responsible offices, prosecution is the one most responsible for them. And therefore, that's where uh, civil society and NGOs come in and sometimes lift some of these burdens. And you realize that without the victims' uh, participation and voice, really you could not uh, do justice. And, and Chair, if I can tell you the most frustrating thing that uh, 
I discovered and we all discover when we go to law school is that law is not justice. And uh, that can be frustrating, but uh, I guess part of the job is you, you get over it and get the job done. <laughs> and uh, so we have the International Crimes Division uh, set up. It's been in place since uh, 2010, uh, handled about uh, 40 cases so far. And we have uh, Lord's Resistance Army post-conflict. Yeah, a remnant of it is in Central African Republic, but really dwindling. But uh, we have two commanders from there. Koyelo, the trial is going on mm -hmm. right now in Igulu. Uh, after 10 years, mm -hmm. and uh, Ongwen mm -hmm. is uh, being tried uh, at The Hague. So we are watching two trials of uh, perpetrators. Of course, there is the argument they were captured as, uh, as young children and uh, as, as part of their defense. But glad to be here and uh, to learn from uh, some of the best. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. We appreciate that greatly. These people are in the belly of the beast in many ways. Louise, we look forward to what's happening in the island of Ireland. Uh, thank you, Charles. Um, I wanted to ask her about Brexit, but she said I'm not allowed to. <laughs> yeah, it's a big day today. I'm not sure what the fate of Northern Ireland feels like it's been decided in London for us this morning. But um, I was invited here today to speak about amnesties, um, which is the main part of my research as an academic. But I think thinking about Northern Ireland is a useful starting point for that because as someone who has lived and worked in Northern Ireland for the last 20 years, in many ways its experiences and approaches to accountability have informed my own thinking. So I think in answer to this question, what I'm going to do is try and pick out three ways Northern Ireland's experiences shapes how I approach understandings of accountability. Um, I'm going to assume that you're all largely familiar with the history of colonialism and partition that provided the backdrop for our 30 years of armed conflict over whether Northern Ireland should be part of the United Kingdom or united with Ireland. So I'm not going to spend any time really explaining that context. But I think it's useful just to note that um, Northern Ireland is a small place. Today we have a population of 1.7 million. During the conflict it was smaller. There are 3,500 people who were killed. Compared to other conflict zones, that does not sound like a large amount. But a survey of victims con conducted by the Commission for Victims and Survivors in 2010 found that one in three of our population self-identify as a victim of bereavement, trauma, and injury. So you get a sense of how this widespread and enduring <coughs> the harms of our conflict are, even today, well into our peace process. Um, last year, Northern Ireland marked the 20th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. In many ways, it's a remarkable achievement. There are very few uh, conflicted societies. I was fortunate to reach this type of landmark phase. But there are a lot of contemporary challenges that still need to be addressed. Our agreement, in many ways, had a lot of very positive, forward-looking commitments around trying to create a society based on notions of equality and human rights but it was silent on questions of truth, accountability, reparations. All that it contained really in relation to those provisions was an early release scheme. What this meant was paramilitaries who had been convicted during the troubles would be released from prison on license over a two year period. <laughs> um, today, anyone convicted, and there, there have not been any convictions since 1998, but if somebody were to be convicted, they would serve a maximum of two years in prison as a consequence of that scheme. Mm -hmm. All of the people who were released from prison, only 4% have been returned to prison for violating their license. Hmm. Now, that is a tiny amount of recidivism when it's compared to ordinary criminals in Northern Ireland. And so that gives me my first lesson when we think about the meaning of accountability or why we need to pursue accountability. Because it suggests that perhaps leniency does not always risk further violence and criminality. So it, it provides a challenge to that. Yesterday, um, when he was discussing universal, jurisdictions in, universal jurisdiction proceedings in Germany, Professor Safalin said something that really struck me. He said that 
we need to pursue these proceedings because we want to show we can't have murderers walking the streets in Germany. Yeah. Well, in Northern Ireland's peace process, we didn't just let the murderers walk the streets, we let them into government. Uh -huh. And I think for many people at the time, that was viewed as a necessary compromise. Not something that people perhaps thought was desirable, but something we needed to do. But over the years that followed, there are ample evidence of former Republican and Loyalist paramilitaries providing <coughs> strong voices in support of the peace process. They've been advocates that have stayed with that peace process and their leadership was able to bring their communities with them at points that were very difficult. And so that suggests to me a second lesson to take from this is that individuals who engage in politically motivated violence shouldn't necessarily be always viewed as unre unrehabilitatable, as inherently evil. People who have engaged in political violence for particular circumstances can perhaps make a contribution to peace in the years that follow. Um, coming at just the last lesson I wanted to pick up, and I think this resonates perhaps with um, many of the things Charles was observing about South Africa. So, over the last 20 years, as I mentioned, we've had no convictions for troubles related to defences. We have had a variety of different types of investigative processes. They've all been very discreet, individualised, focusing on particular high profile events or trying to provide information directly to families in relation to particular deaths. There are a lot of families that have not had their processes investigated even 50 years after the conflict began. Um, but there are a number of gaps that have not been addressed at all. Um, so, there, at present, we have no shared narrative of the causes and consequences of our violence. I've been using terms to discuss it such as conflict and competence. In certain audiences in Northern Ireland, those terms are deeply controversial. I, you know, letters to my university complaining where these terms are used, those sorts of things. So, we have no language even that we can all use to describe our past. We have no memorial to the victims of our troubles that everybody can go to and share. There's no official commemoration in that respect. There's no agreement on who gets to be a victim and who doesn't. There is some consensus around some categories, but there is debates, arguments, contestations, and hierarchies. And we've had very little in the way of overarching institutional acknowledgement of harm. And here I'm talking about state institutions, but also non-state in different ways. And the very little admission of institutional responsibility for the harms that have been done. So the biggest challenge for me today in Northern Ireland is that the past has been used as a way to fight the war by other means. We have what's commonly called as a meta-conflict, mm. through which all the different parties try to use, their preferred, use the past to advance their preferred vision of Northern Ireland's constitutional status. And this contributes to, well, there's a lot that we know about our past. You know, terrorists t tend to admit responsibility for their violence as the reason why they're doing it. There are nonetheless areas of denial and lack of truth that we still have not progressed towards. The uncertainty about our past is politically stabilizing. We recently marked the dubious um, milestone of a thousand years, without, I'm sorry, a thousand days without our devolved power sharing governments that were meant to be set up under the peace process. And all these gaps should inhibit our ability to move towards an inclusive vision of our future and to deepen the ways in which we can learn to live together. So from all this, I come, like, like Charles, with a sense that leniency can be useful, it can be important. And we need, when we think about accountability, we need to think about it from a richer perspective that looks at where we want to get to as a society and what are the gaps we need to address. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Louise, very much indeed. We'll come back and cross-examine you so that we can solve the future problems of the world very shortly. Ninety minutes, that should be fine. <laughs> uh, Chino, we're gra glad to have you with us. Obviously, give us a little brief introduction and we'll come back to you and cross-examine you as well. <laughs> thank you very much, Charles. <laughs> well, I'm the chair of Nigerian Coalition on International Criminal Court. Um, I'm a criminal justice, uh, criminal defense lawyer, uh, working in Nigeria for the past 28 years. Uh, I'm involved in a number of um, criminal defense um, for persons charged with um, what we describe as uh, crimes within the 
Prevention of Terrorism Act, which in Nigeria is the only <coughs> legislation that deals with international crimes. Um, well, I'm to speak on challenges relating to domestic prosecution, domestic implementation of international crimes. And I think one of the um, critical issues is national preparedness. Uh, is the country prepared to investigate <laughs> and to prosecute um, international crimes? And there are three elements to that. The first element is the legal framework. Now, if there is no adequate, if there is no um, incorporation of international crimes into the national uh, laws, it will be difficult to bring a charge under, for international crimes. Uh, in, in Nigeria, there is, the Nigerian legislature has not domesticated um, the Rome Statute of International Criminal Court, um, which would have enabled the four crimes, core crimes, to be part of his criminal laws. Um, of course, for reasons I'm going to explain, um, on the th second, third element, which is the political will, it was deliberate that government had refused over the last 20 years that civil society has pushed for domestication of Rome Statute, that government has refused to do so um, for reasons I will explain later. The, the second element of national preparedness is institutional capacity. The capacity of investigators to gather evidence and analyze evidence, the capacity of um, prosecutors to bring the charges and understand the elements of international crime, and capacity of the judiciary or the courts themselves to deal with that, deal with the issue of witnesses, uh, be able to manage witnesses in this situation of armed conflict, like in Nigeria we have Boko Haram terrorism, um, where even being a witness is very dangerous. So how do you protect witnesses in order to uh, get their testimonies in, in the courts? Um, do you have a robust defense, uh, legal defense? Because without legal aid, it would be difficult to prosecute crimes. Um, of that, those nations. And then the custodial, custodial services, the prisons and places of custody, uh, the adequate protection for persons suspects and so on. In Nigeria, in the last um, six or seven years, we have had about 6,000 persons arrested and detained in respect to terrorism charges awaiting trial. And they are all detained in different facilities, some in private facilities, some in, with state security services, and so on. So that custodial services, uh, being able to manage the kind of um, cases coming in is, um, is, a, is also a challenge. The third issue is the political will of the state to prosecute international crime. In, state, in countries like Nigeria, it is convenient to go after the, the terrorists, the, the Boko Haram. But of course, the Nigerian military is also committing a lot of um, war crimes and crimes against humanity. Uh, so what government has done, what we've had in Nigeria is the Prevention of Terrorism Act, and prosecutors are going after suspects um, who are not you know, soldiers. And once you, you want to touch soldiers, the Nigerian government will, will create resistance. And, um, and I think that is, that is important, that if government is not ready to if this national system is not ready to prosecute everybody, every perpetrator, be they state officials or non-state actors, then that would be effective prosecution of international crime. Um, the other element is where there's a conflict between the elements of international crime and national uh, definitions of crime. The national norms of crime, for instance, uh, genocide, you know, the, you know, if you bring the issue of genocide, what's the, def what's the content of genocide under the international um, statutes and also under Nigerian law? There, there are differences in terms of jurisprudential definition. Um, there is also the question of immunities. Most domestic constitutions provide for immunities for heads of state and senior officials. Nigeria is an example, section 308 of our constitution and of course, constitution many common law African countries provide those immunities, which, as we learned yesterday, do not exist under the customary international law. Uh, so when there are such immunities, then that restricts the, the, kind, the, 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 the kind of perpetrators you may bring to, 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 to justice. Finally, is the issue of um, victims and their participation. In many of the common law countries, like Nigeria, victims are mere witnesses in the criminal proceedings. And sometimes 
they are not being given attention or protection. And that's a problem, that's one of the hindrances. Most prosecutions are based on testimonies of witnesses. And when witnesses are not given adequate protection, then that's a problem. And the number of things have gone in, there's no, there's, if there's no legislation to provide for victim protection, um, um, if there's no pro provisions to alternatives to um, physical testimonies in open court to, to reduce risks of reprisals, then victims will not turn up. Um, and that's a challenge. In other words, the last uh, five or six years, and Bettina Wehmo has been doing a lot of work trying to train prosecutors in the context of terrorism. Um, of all the about 6,000 cases in the docket of the military prosecutors, actually less than 300 has been dealt with effectively. <laughs> and out of the 300 that have been processed, only about 20 were full trials. So you can see that it's less than 1% or cases that went to full trials because of absence of witnesses, because of absence of um, credible evidence gathering, credible evidence analysis, and you know, capacity of prosecutors and investigators to deal with international crime. So the challenge of prosecuting international crime in domestic level is many, and I think it's important that we begin to look at um, the duty of international ju justice experts in increasing complementarity capacity or state to be able to address those crimes. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, we're going to stay with you for a moment. You've given us uh, an extensive introduction to this discussion. Um, just talk to us a little bit about those people uh, charged with terrorism, uh, cases that have not been able to go through the full process of the courts and law. In two sentences, who are they? Are they good guys or are they bad guys? Who are they? Well, my, my training as a lawyer is that anybody who is suspected of a crime is presumed innocent mm -hmm. until he's proved guilty. So I can't call them bad guys. I can call them suspects. Uh, these are persons suspected of being involved in terrorism and being members of t terrorist organization or even financing um, terrorism. Now, bear in mind that the Nigerian government, for instance, is paying attention to terrorism, which is a major challenge in the country now. That is not international crime, so-called, so because even though elements of war crimes is contained in the Prevention of Terrorism Act, you know, it, it does not have the same elements as you see in the Rome Statute of International Criminal Court, for instance. Um, so the threshold, or the individual threshold for proof of crime or terrorism or financing terrorism or belonging to a terrorist organization is completely different from the threshold of war crimes or crime against humanity. Uh, it, it, that's in the background of the fact that the uh, Office of Tribal Prosecutor that has been uh, undertaking preliminary examination of Nigerians since 2011, and each time they find out that both um, Boko Haram and Nigerian military had committed probably war crimes and crimes against humanity. So the people I wouldn't say are suspects, the ordinary people, some of them are combatants, and some of them are people in the communities who are accused of supporting terrorists and they're arrested and kept in detention. But what, mat what matters is that some of them have been in detention for many years and they have not been tried. Yeah. Thank you very much. You mentioned again uh, Boko Haram. Yes. Who's winning the war? Well, the, um, it, it's a non-conventional warfare, and in, in those contests, is the parameter of who is winning it, it differs, depends on contest. Uh, uh, these are, you're fighting people who you don't even know. So the Nigerian military deploys its resources you know, to fight people who go bombing public places. Uh, how do you do that? So he's trying to raise his intelligence to be able to do that. And the Consequences of that is that you have a high level of civilian casualties uh, because in any community you go in, everybody's a suspect, you know. Um, so I wouldn't say, that I think the Nigerian government has been able to manage, have been able to scale down the capacity of Boko Haram to cause um, havoc. I think they have been able to do that. Uh, unlike in 2011 to 2014 where you have um, bombings, 
in public places almost every week. Now, in 2019, I don't think we have more than three or four incidents. So the, the, the capacity of Boko Haram has simply been decimated. But that also creates its own problem in the region because having driven them away from, from the Nigerian borders, most of the Boko Haram uh, terrorists have moved on to Chad, to Niger Republic, to Cameroon, and had destabilized those, that region. So the entire Lake Chad region faces similar ch challenges. And um, um, we listened this, uh, this morning to problems arising in Chad. It is not unconnected with the, the government's uh, involvement in trying to curtail Boko Haram that has spilled into, into that country. So it's a war, and who loses? The civilians, the ordinary people, not the combatants. That Nigerian people are the ones who lose the war. It's the civilians that always lose in war contests. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. You've reminded us that those borders in Africa, all over the world, but Africa as well, are very porous. And so what may be seen as a Nigerian problem, for example, soon spreads and it becomes a regional problem. So we're not only talking about international crime versus domestic crime. The third one, of course, is <coughs> regional crime. Would you, would you comment on that? Yes, of course. Uh, and that's why the countries in the Lake, Lake Chad region, Nigeria, Niger, um, Cameroon, and, uh, have come together to set up a, a multinational force to address the borders, because the borders are very porous, the movement of small arms um, through the borders, especially down from Libya um, up, up, up to Nigeria. Um, so once there is no control of movement of arms, it becomes difficult to control what's going on. So is international cooperation in that respect? Um, and I think is international cooperation is only with respect to, to combat. They've, we've not seen international cooperation with respect to investigation, exchange of intelligence, and, um, and prosecutions. And another important element to that is the, um, the international community itself being interested in, in that. Because now what is happening in, in that region is that ISIS is active. Um, and those arms come from somewhere. Someone is supporting or funding terrorist movement um, in, in that region. Um, so at the end of the day, it's cooperation across states that's very important. Thank you. I'm going to ask you one further question to drill down just a little bit, and then we're going to leave you in peace for a while. Um, what do you say about the oil industry in Nigeria? Now, the perception is that a lot of money that's going to Boko Haram and unrest in the region generally is coming from some of the captains of the oil industry. Is that true? Or is that false media reporting? <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't say, I don't think that is true because the, um, obviously the oil resources obviously is not in the hands of terrorists. I mean, it is not there very far away then up there in the northeast, why Nigeria oil resources is down in the south-south, Nigeria Delta. Um, like every criminal, any criminal gangs, they get their resources from different sources, kidnapping, ransom, trading arms, you know, um, all kinds of gun running and, and drug trafficking and, and so on. <clears throat> and of course, they also traffic in human persons. I mean, the Boko Haram moves into a community, adopts young people and, and sell them off. Um, and the case of Shibor girls is well known. Um, half of the 291 girls that were adopted in the secondary school had not returned up to, to after, since 2014. So um, this is a serious criminal organized crime. Uh, their sources of income is not just one. So I wouldn't say all you, all you, all you money funds Boko Haram. On the contrary, the Nigerian government relies on all your resources to, to, to fight Boko Haram. Thank you so very much. For those of you who follow the international media, you know there's been quite a lot of verbal conflict between South Africa and Nigeria. Your president has just come to visit us in South Africa, and so we're good, good friends all over again. <laughs> I, I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> um,
let's come back to you, uh, Louise, if we may. Sure. To what extent is the situation in your part of the world somewhat unique? It has a long history. Mm -hmm. It's entrenched. You haven't had major prosecutions. Mm -hmm. You've also said recidivism is uh, at a very, very low level. Mm -hmm. What's the secret? <laughs> I think all conflict situations have degrees of uniqueness. Um, the, there are many features to do with Northern Ireland that are similar to other situations and indeed the success of our peace process has, has meant that it's been somewhere that places often want to borrow from or learn what has worked. Where there, it's, I think for many peace process you can learn what has worked and what has not worked. The things that probably have been more positive have been the institutional reform measures towards protecting human rights and building equality, but that has only gone so far in the absence of more societal reconciliation. But I guess if I want to step back a little bit and think about whether Northern Ireland is unique in terms of perhaps not pursuing widespread prosecutions, in terms of pursuing leniency programs, I think what is interesting for me is that amnesties are frequently used in many parts of the world. Um, in preparing for this seminar today, I had to look at the PAX Peace Agreement database, which has been created by Christine Bell and colleagues at the University of Edinburgh. And that contains information on over 100, no, so 1,500 peace agreements in 140 countries. And that's all the peace agreement texts, from the ceasefire stage right up to post-peace agreement documents. And I drill down within that and look just at the comprehensive peace agreements. And of those, I found that 49% contain commitments to grant amnesty. And I thought that was quite a high level. It's not an unusual finding. There were studies done in 2007 that talked to, about the prevalence of amnesties and peace agreement texts. What I then tried to do is, I have a database of amnesty laws around the world, uh, ranging from 1945 to 2016, of all types of settings. So I looked into my own database and used that to chart the implementation of those peace agreement amnesty commitments to see how many of those commitments resulted in laws, resulted in an actual amnesty process. And I found that 83% did. Mm. Now, I'm not sure whether there's any comparable studies of char charting the implementation of other type forms of peace agreement commitments, but for me, that seems like quite a high level of implementation. It was certainly higher than I expected when I began to look into that process. So we can see Northern Ireland is not unusual, perhaps, in adopting some forms of leniency. That they, you know, I'm just looking at amnesties there. Northern Ireland hasn't had an amnesty. It's had different forms of leniency. Um, I guess the question that, ask, that begs for me is how useful are amnesties or leniency processes in contributing to peace? So Northern Ireland has had some success because our peace process has lasted for 20 years, even in the absence of criminal prosecutions. Um, more broadly, uh, there, are, there is a growing body of academic literature that's trying to quantitatively measure the impact of amnesties on peace processes. Uh, it's not an extensive literature. I, think, I can think of maybe 10 or 12 publications that are out there at the moment. And I have reviewed all of those at different points. And I think what was striking for me is that with the exception of one early study from 2007, which self-described its findings as tentative, the rest of the studies all had some consensus that they said amnesty could contribute positively to peace. Now, there are a number of challenges with that and those findings. I mean, for, for me, it points in a particular direction about what we can say we know right now. But those studies, by and large, treated all amnesties as identical. They didn't try and distinguish between the context the amnesty was introduced, the moment which they're introduced, whether it was conditional, what form of legal effects it had. In some cases, they included um, promises of amnesty that may not have been implemented in practice. So there's a lot of things going on there. Um, one of the studies by Jeff Dancy, which is one of the more, thought, more detailed and thoughtful ones, suggested that perhaps where international crimes were excluded from the scope of an amnesty, that increased the possibility of the amnesty having a positive outcome. Mm -hmm. But I think what we can see at the moment from Northern Ireland, perhaps, and from, other and from this growing quantitative data, is that simply saying amnesties are bad for peace, there's, there isn't enough evidence to support that assumption. 
and we need to do some more work. And from my perspective, that means more finely grained work around what is it about the design features of amnesty processes, what forms of amnesty perhaps maximize the outcome of, of an amnesty process. But I think just the last point on that is, for me, amnesties are a tactic, not a strategy. They are not something that in and of themselves can deliver peace. Mm -hmm. And they're not something that should be given away unconditionally. Mm -hmm. They are something which are most effective where they're built into a peace process and built, built into measures to build security and contribute to accountability in different ways. And where we think about their impact, I think bearing that in mind is, is, is hugely important. And it speaks to not just the design of the amnesty process, but following through on the implementation. And mm -hmm. I think South Africa is an interesting example of that because perceptions of the amnesty are often influenced around the fact that the political will wasn't there to follow up with the prosecutions. Mm -hmm. So I think we, you know, understanding what role they have means situating them in that broader context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, uh, Louis, sorry, mm -hmm. I think, uh, Louise, as, uh, as I listen to you, is the int there is no panacea for transitional justice. It doesn't exist. I think it is a relationship between the soft and the hard, mm -hmm. between what you've referred to amnesties and prosecution. Uh, I've got a good friend who, whenever we get into this debate, also reminds me the politics of luck, he said. The moment, what happens? And he always liked to say, you had a Mandela. We've never had one. We're not going to have another one for 200 years. Um, could you identify what it is that is cause, causing some rapprochement in your situation? It's been flexible in mm -hmm. terms of the legal side, but there is, I think, an attitudinal change. Is there? In Northern Ireland? Yes. There was. There was. And that the, yes, the capacity for political generosity to listen to the other, to yeah. recognize that to recognize that compromises were needed, and not just on questions of accountability, more broadly, in in recognizing entry into the governance mm. of rep representatives of former paramilitary organisations, for example, all of that sp rec generosity, recognition, acknowledgement was an important part of our peace process, yeah. and it was a necessary component to making the inhabitants of Northern Ireland, all of them, feel like this was a place where they belonged. Mm. Uh, sadly, where we are right now, and I'm not going to speak about Brexit, but that has narrowed the space for generosity and compromise, and we are far away from having Mandela figures yeah, at the yeah, moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is the challenge, mm -hmm. isn't it? It's an, in, mm -hmm. it's an enduring situation, and we have our ups and downs, and we've got to monitor mm -hmm. them as, as we go mm -hmm. along the line. You, uh, whenever I think of uh, the Northern Ireland situation, mm -hmm. I think of that historic memory. Mm -hmm. And we've got it in South Africa as well. I don't know who's the worst off, you or us, but there is historic mem uh, uh, memory. And uh, you know, good old Max Weber, mm -hmm. heard of him in this place? I mean, he said, culture is not a light cloak mm -hmm. that you can lift off your shoulders when you so desire mm -hmm. and put it back. It's deep, deep in the marrow of your bones. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the challenge that we face uh, in Africa generally and mm -hmm. in Latin America and elsewhere is how do we deal with that culture that's so entrenched? Mm -hmm. And that's where I think uh, mm -hmm. Northern Ireland's worked at it. Mm -hmm. We have, we have. I, mean, I think. I'll come back to the Northern Ireland moment. I guess I was struck by something you said a moment ago. You used the phrase kind of binary choices between mm. amnesty and accountability. And yeah. I think something from Northern Ireland that teaches me is that we don't, it's not just a question of a binary choice between trials and amnesties. Mm. And Colombia, I think, is also instructive in this respect. States have a menu of choices, a mm. spectrum. When I use phrases like leniency, I mean amnesty, particularly conditional amnesties, is one form of leniency. There are others. The pardons, use immunity, plea agreements, mm. uh, conditional releases, uh, alternative sanctions. There's any number of things that states can choose from. And Northern Ireland has used those alternative forms of accountability tactically at various moments to disarm paramilitaries, to incentivize offenders coming and telling the truth to public inquiries, to facilitate the remains of people who have di disappeared. 
And those are all useful. So I think, firstly, it's important to recognize this. This is not a question of amnesty and accountability. It's something much broader. And to my mind, international <laughs> law allows space for these types of flexibility approaches. It creates useful limits, and I'm happy to talk about that if you want, about where, what is the perimeters of what is acceptable and not. But within that, there is space for creativity. There is space for flexibility. Oh. And I think that's very useful. And on t turning to the question of education and history and narrative, I was really struck about what you said about the Mandela's remarks and the significance of this African Truth Commission, about the importance of getting a multiplicity of voices, the importance of t getting people to talk about why they engaged in certain crimes, the structures in which they worked. And that can be important for countering denial. It can be important for pinpointing what went wrong in the institutions and trying to accurately <coughs> provide remedies to that. And we have questions to ask, I guess, about what is the most effective mechanism for doing that. Trials have a clear utility, but they, they have limitations in what they can achieve as well. And so for me, that's why it's worth exploring broader conceptualizations of accountability, because they gave us different ways of getting to some of those tricky challenges, I think. Um, and in Northern Ireland, you're right, we have long memories, a long and deep history. If you ask some people, when did the conflict begin? They're not going to say 1968, they're going to say 800 years ago. And today, part of what's been discussed as we've been going through a process to, for the first time, develop a comprehensive approach to deal with the past is a debate even about the meaning of history and how it gets to be written and whether we can revisit our history in light of new evidence and new approaches to analysis and try and develop a more inclusive narrative. So even that, even the notion of historical study is something that is debated and we have more to do on, I think. Thank you very much. I wish we had time to push you to unpack all of that, but that's given us an insight into your situation. We're extremely grateful, Mike. Over to you, sir. We have got time against us, but we're going to keep moving. This is African time, you know, so these people don't all understand that, but let's try and honor them. Uh, thank you very much. So, we... About 20 years ago, I was a legal assistant to the president, and I could not understand why he was not uh, taking my advice immediately, <laughs> until uh, I realized that uh, the president also had an economic advisor, military advisor, security, and, and, and all other advisors, and that uh, he was looking at things from a much broader perspective. This came to me when we were trying to work out the Amnesty Act vis-a-vis -vis, uh, prosecution, International Crimes Division. And uh, one head of the International Criminal Division, a judge, one day had an outburst and was condemning the government for having passed the Amnesty Act at all because it was uh, working against uh, prosecution and uh, promoting impunity in a way. But I, I then realized that the government was looking at this from completely different perspective. The government wanted, above all, to end the war, to end the conflict. The judge wanted to, you know, prosecute all those responsible for the, for the crimes. <clears throat> and the Amnesty Act wanted to come and uh, you know, ensure that people granted amnesty so that they denounce and they come from, uh, from the fight. Uh, thankfully, the Amnesty Act has a provision that uh, before it grants amnesty, the DPP, the chief prosecutor, I must, uh, I must have a say in whether the amnesty should be granted or not. And uh, that's where we come to the current trial of uh, Thomas Coelho which trial has take, is now in its 10th year because Coelho first had to go to court to challenge the decision to prosecute him because he was saying he had uh, applied for amnesty and others before him had been granted until the matter went all the way to the Supreme Court of Uganda and the Supreme Court said uh, he had to be tried. So we have now started a trial 10 years later. And of course, some people ask the question, <coughs> Coelho is one man, and uh, we have spent 10 years. We are uh, <laughs> four judges are on standby to try Coelho. I have a whole army of prosecutors. Mm. 
the question some of people in the public are asking, why are you dedicating so much resources to trying one, one individual when we have so many other cases backlogged in the system? And I think that is where we have to come in with uh, explanations for international cr criminal law and, and that kind of thing. But the public may not see it the way we see it. So we have to come down into the arena and uh, so we, we've, uh, the International Crimes Court in Uganda, as I mentioned, has had actually quite a few accomplishments, the first of its kind in the region. It has now established its own rules of pro procedure, and I think the court was very critical in the ending the insurgency of the Lord's Resistance Army. I mean, there are many players who did this, but it was one of them. We've been able to develop uh, international criminal law jurisprudence uh, domestically, and uh, I think the tension between the Amnesty Act and the International Crimes Division has been uh, resolved uh, successfully. And uh, we have used the International Crimes Division to try other crimes, offenses under the penal code, trafficking in persons, and so on. So the, the, the court, I think, has done uh, a lot of good. Of course, challenges remain, uh, one of them being manpower in uh, place where we have a shortage of judges in the high court, uh, devoting four judges full time to wait and, uh, and preside over one trial uh, can be seen as a waste. Uh, the issue of victims and witnesses, of course, remains an issue. After 10 years, in fact, maybe 20, are the victims still willing? Are they still available? Are they still uh, able to remember? Can you find them? Those are very, very big issues. Mm -hmm. The length of the trial itself, is it uh, justifiable? Of course, we have issues of death penalty versus uh, no death penalty. Uganda, we still have the death penalty on the law books. And, uh, and uh, yes, I, I will not say any more about that, but yeah, there is the tension between uh, the International Criminal Court saying, uh, no death penalty and uh, us having. Of course, uh, we have some interesting debates about Ongwen being tried in The Hague and mm -hmm. Koyelo being tried in Gulu. Uh, the court uh, had to adjourn two weeks ago in Gulu because uh, there was a rumor that some remnants of uh, the Lord's Resistance Army were planning to come and rescue one of their own. Personally, I think it was uh, it, it, it was not credible, but you know, those of you who have worked in security and intelligence know that uh, you can never take a threat lightly. So the, the court closed and said uh, security should first uh, take care and cordon off the court and, and, and so on. So th this still uh, remains. But uh, having been to Gulu, which was the epicenter of this conflict, 20 years ago and seeing what it was like, desolate with uh, boys walking from the camps to Gulu town for safety and uh, going back to Gulu now and seeing a vibrant, uh, peaceful town. I think we can say that uh, there's a lot that can be said that uh, the efforts have not been in vain and we give credit, as you know, success has many fathers, but uh, International criminal law, I think, can pat itself on the back and say it played a very important role in this uh, piece. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. You've spoken about, and just a very short answer would satisfy me. I don't know about these people. What about Mr. Coney? He, he's wandering around somewhere. Why has he not been arrested? Whose task is it to arrest him? Because that's the rub between international law and uh, domestic problems. Mm. The last time we heard about Mr. Kony was that he was in Central African Republic. Actually, he has not been seen in public, uh, I think, the last 20 years. There have been rumors that uh, he has uh, cancer of the throat, that he has died. I think Kony is, uh, is a name we can talk about, uh, like... Everybody, I tell them I'm from Uganda and they ask me about Idi Amin. I think Kony has joined Idi Amin in uh, being a, a legend, but uh, just a ghost in Uganda really is no longer a force to reckon with. <laughs>
Thank you very much. Uh, Uganda is such an interesting place uh, where I've been privileged to work a little bit on and off. So thank you, thank you for that. Now, Justice, tell us what is going to happen in um, your part of the world, in Colombia. Such an interesting process. Uh, an awareness of the needs of FARC. Can you say also a little bit about the socio-economic situation? I think the thing's called land, which is a major problem in Africa. What about Colombia? The, the peace process from the part of, on behalf of the FARC, was a process that allowed this FARC movement to fight for the historical reasons by which, in 1964, they started a revolution. This was a peasant revolution. This was a claim for land for very poor peasants. So the peace accord is a very robust peace by which not only uh, the situation of the perpetrators have to be investigated and sanctioned by, by the SJP, but it's a very robust instrument of social transformation. In fact, one of the main chapters of this peace accord relates to the agrarian reform. The government is obliged to introduce this reform that was promised in Colombia in the 1930s through different constitutional amendments that was in, and that was not a reality and only in the future, these duties that are programmed in the peace accord has to be fully fulfilled. So uh, really, this is the context of this internal civil war. It is the fight for resources, for populations that live in the peripheric zones of Colombia. And the FARC is the expression, ideologically, of that need. And so one very important part of this agreement relates to economic, social economic rights, the presence of the social state in those parts of the territory that have been abandoned by the Colombian state. The vacuum of this present state implies misery and hunger for many people. So, as I said, half of this Accord that now has been um, given the hierarchy of a constitutional norm uh, introduces duties for the next three governments in Colombia. A government term is four years, so for the next 16 years, uh, the duty of the government is to offer land to the poor, to resolve economic and social problems of that population, and to introduce also the funds necessary to do so uh, through the budgetary process and the planning process. Public policies in terms of reparation, public policy in terms of education and health, it is necessary. In more than 170 municipalities, where the impact of this internal conflict was more felt by the population, the government has to introduce development concrete plans that have to be uh, decided with the participation of the population there. So we are not just at the end of an internal conflict, we are just in presence of the construction and the building up of the social state in half of the territory of Colombia. Thank you very much indeed. 16 years to address that one. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very short period, isn't it? Yes. You know, we've been addressing it for 25 years in South Africa and we've made little to no progress. So this is a huge challenge, the socio-economic side of it. <coughs> is there a sense uh, of optimism? 
in FARC, for example? As I said in my remarked words initially, the leader of the negotiations rearmed, but the response of the FARC was to adhere deeply, more deeply even, to the peace accord. 90% of the members of the FARC now are working in special territories where they are demobilized. They are receiving uh, funds from the state in order to make some small enterprises. And they are working within a political party. That is the party that uh, is formed by this ideology. They have seats in the Congress. They participate politically. And so I think that from the part of the, of, of, of the FARC, what we have seen in Colombia is a full uh, compliance with all the duties that emerge from this accord. Uh, but I said, this is a very long-term accord. And so we, we need also civil society to sustain the accord. We need other political parties to do so. And I think that in these three governments, we are going to achieve finally the peace. Because uh, President, uh, President Santos had the intelligence to introduce this 300 pages peace accord into the Constitution. So now, the, uh, the, back red, the, back, the background of the accord is the Constitution. The foundation of, the, of this accord is the Constitution. And this constitution and, and the constitution in Colombia is embedded in human rights and respect to international human rights. And now you have all the content of this accord that really gives all the possibilities for the state to construct social state for the poor. Now, as being Constitution amended the Constitution. It, has very difficult, it is very difficult for any other government to change the court. As I said before, President Duque, that was backed by uh, former President Uribe, that this is an enemy of the political uh, process of the peace, tried initially to come back and to introduce some bombardment over some pieces of this a normative construction of the peace, but he was not, he couldn't, he was not possible for him to do so because the constitutional norm was safeguarded by the constitutional court, and so it was impossible to introduce these reforms. One, as I said, was the, the intent to create a judicial panel that will only investigate and prosecute the military, and the other was to veto the statutory law of, of the SJP, and it was not possible. Because of what? Because the accord now is constructed over a rock, and the rock is the Constitution. Thank you very, very much, sir. Um, certainly the accord, uh, as it's available to everyone, uh, that took place in relation to the Colombian situation is incredible. You know, I wish you all the, the good luck in the world. Um, I think the biggest challenges, as I see it, as a South African looking into a Colombian situation that I know little about, um, one is time. You know, it's a long time to satisfy people, and some of those people are going to become restless in that time. And the other one, of course, is the will of successive governments. Now, I can talk to you about governments uh, in South Africa, you know, where we get off to a roaring start and then it winds down. Well, you know, that's a challenge you're going to face and at the core of the accords written into the Constitution are all those uh, precautions. Now, you know, we've all spoken too long. Um, we've got 15 minutes with a push. Uh, let's open it to the floor. And we're going to take a few questions, and then I'm going to allow the panel to respond with discretion and discipline. <laughs> Please. Please go ahead. Right in the middle. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Right. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> is this on? 
Yes, um, Jennifer Trahan, NYU. Um, so in talking about prosecutions at the domestic level, I wonder if you have any reflections. It's sometimes observed there is no one international institution that helps with domestic capacity building. The ICC is told it, it doesn't have the budget to do this. Um, to what extent have you received international assistance? Has it been helpful? Um, what, um, I think at, currently this process is very ad hoc. So some countries help with this, some help with that. In your view, should this be more centralized? Should there be one go-to place that helps with um, domestic? Or do you actually prefer not having international assistance that you, know, you appreciate domestic ownership and you find you know, international assistance um, and um, help can come with strings attached and you actually don't seek more. Um, so what are your views on kind of this aspect? Thank you. Should we take you, sir, and then we'll come over to, over to you? Okay. <coughs> Thank you very much for all the presentations. Very interesting. My question is for Maria Luis. Um, I was wondering whether you could say uh, something about the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, Inter-American System of, of Human Rights, with regards to amnesty and with regards to the full prohibition of amnesties that they, they have imposed o over Latin American countries. Thank you. Um, Maurits Barendrecht, uh, Hague Institute for Innovation of Law. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated by the, the continuum that you are describing, uh, amnesty, uh, truth finding, and, and prosecution. And, and I'm also fascinated by um, cases coming out of the South African Truth Commission process and the amnesty process in, in, um, uh, in Northern Ireland where some form of accountability would still be needed. And, and we are then looking at the prosecutions that, that take years and, and a lot of time, and they're stopped many times. You see that here also. Huh? After, in, in 1955, yeah, most of the prosecutions were, were stopped. That, that was something that took me uh, by surprise from, from the exhibition. So, so what, what, what's happening? Uh, is, there, is, is prosecution too divisive? Uh, are, are we afraid of continuing with that process because it will cause new conflict? And if so, what can we do to make it less divisive? Do, do you see possibilities for that? Let's come back to the panel. Excuse me. Back to the panel in that case. and. Uh, Let's come to some sort of response. I think there were people picking on you a little bit there, uh, uh, <laughs> Louise. So why don't we start with you? Sure. Um, I guess I, I won't answer so much the first question about the capacity building because that's been less relevant to Northern Ireland. International involvement has been hugely beneficial throughout our peace process in a number of ways, but largely our process has been domestically owned, and I think that's a positive of, mm -hmm. of the process. On the Inter-American case law, um, it's a rich, robust body of case law that's been developed over a number of years and in many ways has been at the vanguard of developments in the question, in the question of the legality of amnesties. I guess there are three things I would highlight about it. Uh, firstly, there has been uh, a number of statements where they've articulated a robust rejection of amnesty laws. They have predominantly come from countries with a history of dictatorship. And they, but they've moved away from notions of self-amnesty and they'll say it's the nature of the crime itself that can't be amnestied. But I think there has been a recognition of a space that, that transitions from conflict are somewhat different and a tolerance of some form of leniency in those types of transitions in the inter-American case law. And to support that, I'd point to the series of judgments on Colombia where the court has found that the alternative sanctions regimes are not amnesties and did not find them to be incompatible with the convention. I think the concurring opinion in the El Mozote case that talked mm. about the difference in the nature of those transitions is fundamentally important. And I think also, I just want to flag that the inter-American case law is not reflective of the rest of the world. It's a regional approach that's a response to a particular regional history of amnesties. 
in Northern Ireland, we are subject to the European Court of Human Rights, and their case law hasn't, it's not as developed, the issue hasn't come before the court as much, but where they have done, they have accepted, well, the, the judgments are somewhat contradictory and it's hard to pinpoint it, but there have been some cases where they have said that states can grant amnesties for violations of the right to life that they feel are necessary, provided it meets the standard uh, limitation requirements. Um, in the Margus case, which was not about violations of the right to life, but international crimes, they talked about an emergent tendency within international law, rather than clearly established rules, and they left open the space potentially for amnesties that are part of reconciliation processes to be permissible. So it's not clear how the court would judge that yet. So the inter-American case law is, I think, not reflective of other regions, perhaps. And then, on whether accountability is still needed and what's happening in Northern Ireland that we haven't had it, um, I think we haven't had it because there was the problems with evidence being collected at the time as a recurring theme. I mean, it's, it's somewhat contradictory because we hear there are millions of documents in the archives, the police force, in the public prosecution mm -hmm. services. Occasionally we hear you know, the British state finds all these hidden archives to do with the colonial period that include Northern Ireland. And so we're not quite sure what there is in terms of documentary evidence, but forensic standards weren't fully adhered to and um, during the conflict. Um, so I think there's potentially some evidence problems. There's also been a consistent problem with the lack of political will. There is, where there have been investigations, they have been obfuscated by lack of resources, lack of disclosure of documents, a number of things. So there have been some processes that have worked well and importantly on a limited number of, of inquiries, but as routinely there is evidence of public, um, lack of public will. But there is still a demand for accountability. It's not going away. This is why we're still talking about this 20 years later. It's on the front pages of our papers routinely, week after week. This is something that's part of our public debate, and it doesn't go away. Victims still want answers, but whether they want those answers in trials or in other formats, that is something which is, there is not one coherent view. Even within one fa some of the more high-profile victims' families, they have different positions on this. And so it's, mm -hmm. there are a number of ways in which accountability could be delivered, and I think it's difficult to find one that would give everybody the answers they need. Thank you very much. Shouldn't you have uh, this responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the coalition of the International Criminal Court? Do you want to just revisit your presentation in terms of the questions that we have? Yeah. Time is us. Yes, I agree, I agree with uh, Maria Lisa that um, accountability is not a one-way traffic. There are different ways of pursuing accountability, and prosecution is just one. Um, sometimes it doesn't bring closure to victims. Um, so amnesty, leniency, pardons is, is an aggregate of of mechanisms to bring accountability. Uh, but that also, uh, that brings me to the question about international assistance. Um, I think, yeah, I agree with you that international assistance has been very ad hoc. Ad hoc. Um, and the key issue about dealing with accountability at national level is having the capacity to do so. And capacity has to do with technical capacity, capacity of institutions, um, even the political commitment of political leaders. To, to seek accountability, outreaches to victims to understand what it's all about. Um, it's a whole lot of stuff. But at the moment, there is no uh, centralized, there's no adequate international assistance to, to this. And that's why yesterday's panel about um, um, you know, investigations and evidence gathering through international uh, uh, mechanisms. I think if it's infused into the domestic institutions, they will be able to build cap local capacity in order to ad advance domestic accountability. And uh, finally, international assistance is not just at, at international level, international like UN level, ICC level. At regional level, um, just like Inter-American uh, Commission, the African Union has also uh, taken steps to address issues relating to accountability. Um, just in February 2019, the African Union adopted the transitional, just, transitional justice policy and is working towards creating a framework where countries in Africa can deliver transitional justice using that framework. So those kind of, um, those kind of um, documents can be op operationalized and assist, the state can be assisted to you know, deliver accountability in their jurisdiction.
So the internet justice system is very important, and it does not derogate domestic ownership. Because even when you give assistance um, in terms of expertise, in terms of resources, in terms of building capacity, um, it does not you know, take away the ownership that is required for justice to be properly delivered. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, can we stretch it and have one last comment because of the status of the lady involved? <laughs> Um, I'm so sorry to keep people from lunch, but uh, I did have a question, just because the terminology that's being used is slightly broad. So leniency is a wonderful idea, implying con you know, so particularized consideration of an individual's status and, and, and to be lenient. Amnesty is sort of different, and what I was unclear about from the panel is whether the suggestion was that amnesty, for example, for crimes against humanity or genocide would be appropriate in, I mean, that was just a little unclear because Protocol 2 says after a conflict, you should have a general amnesty, right, for combatants, for example. But what I sort of thought I was hearing was even for genocide or crimes against humanity, at least there was some openness to amnesties for that, and I would sort of think that would not be okay. So I, I'd love a response on that. Okay. Anybody want to comment on that very quickly? And then we're going to wrap it up. Judge, you tell us. Um, in Colombia, uh, there is a long-standing tradition to grant amnesties to any internal conflicts. But always, even though this tradition is back up from 50 years, uh, always are excluded what we have called atrocious crimes. And uh, in the normative uh, a status of, of this jurisdiction in the body of norms and regulations, it is very clear that this amnesty cannot be granted for the core crimes, in other words, for crimes that fall under the competence of the ICC, just for political motivated crimes, minor crimes. And also these, um, uh, these amnesties are not absolute, they are very relative and they are conditioned with with the cooperation and the duties of cooperation to truth by the, by the grantees and the reparation of victims. So it's not always permanent and it has to be surveilled by the judges. Thank you. Louise is leaning one for me here to give her two minutes. <laughs> so blame her on me, right? Sorry, Eduardo. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that's an interesting question, and it's one which I think is hotly disputed when you talk about the legality of amnesty laws. Where amnesties correspond to treaty law, there's clearer standards around what is permissible and what is not. For questions of crimes against humanity and war crimes and non-international armed conflicts, we're relying much more on customary international law. And there, people take divergent approaches in how we identify existing customary international law. Um, I was... Note, I noted that last year the UN Special Rapporteur tasked with developing the Coven Convention on Crimes Against Humanity observed that there's mixed state practice with regard to whether these crimes can be amnestied or not. And that is something that I have similar findings from from my own database of amnesty laws. So if I had more time, I would have shown you the slides, but roughly I have identified 123 amnesties for international crimes enacted in conflict situations between 1990 and 2016. If I look at how many of those include international crimes and how many exclude, the numbers are the same. If I look at them over a time period, from, for the, they look on year and year and see if there's been a shift, because a lot has happened, the creation of the International Criminal Court, etc., to try and determine how we've seen a move away, we're not. The trend lines have remained relatively constant. So as, as obviously identifying state practice is a complex exercise. There are many different sources we could look to for that. But for me, what states are actually doing in terms of granting amnesties is a significant source of state practice. And at present, it's very difficult to say that there's any consistent and widespread practice to exclude international crimes from the scope of amnesty laws. And I think when that's put on top of state unwillingness to sign treaty prohibitions, prohibiting amnesties when, they offer, when it's been negotiated at the Rome Statute, at the International Covenant on Enforced Disappearances, and I think if we had a look at where states are willing to endorse financially support 
or otherwise engage in amnesty processes in other countries, you would also find that there's mixed practice there, even from states that are parties to the ICC. And so I think at the moment it's difficult, just looking at state practice and opinion of yours, it goes with it, to say the customary international law is clear on this matter. Thank you, Louise, very much indeed. I shall give you my three points in three sentences. The first is that I think there is consensus that there ought to be flexibility and how, on how one deals with a post-conflict situation. But there are limits. There are limits. And it's very, very difficult in domestic situations to always interpret that. But I say thank God for the ICC in terms of those limits. That's very important. That's one. Number two is that I hear everybody talking about something called capacity. You know, a huge, huge responsibility without the capacity to do it. And so the, the, the very good question that you ask is do we need international support, very quickly, because he's not going to give me the time, it depends what sort of support you're talking about. You can't come and tell us what to do or take over, but can I put it crudely? Give us your money and give us your resources, and that's the one that we've got to work out. Uh, and my final comment is that um, there's a context for everything, isn't there? When I look back to the 1990s in South Africa, wow, it would have been great if we could have done one, two, and three. You know what? We just couldn't do it. And so context concerns time, and it concerns place. And I think that's what I hear from my colleagues. I want to thank all of them for their input. Sorry we didn't hear more from you, but thank you very much indeed for your attention.